Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I will start chapter 19 of the AS and A Level Biology syllabus. So I know it's been a while since you heard from me but I had to take time off to prepare my students for the May-June exams this year and also had to finish the AS syllabus with my year one students. So I hope that you've been revising and you've been studying. I believe that this channel will now become helpful for those who are preparing for the October November exams. Um, so um, I hope that you find it helpful. So for chapter 19, it is the last chapter of the A-level biology syllabus. It focuses on the principles of genetic technology and there isn't so much to know here in terms of technical detail. But as per my usual style, I will go through most of the concepts that you have to know and I believe that they should be sufficient enough for you to practice the exams. So in another video, I'll do some exam tips and I will also share changes to the biology syllabus for the next year. Um, I think that's for 2022 to 2024, 2025. Not really sure, but I'll check. I will also be doing lots of parts question videos. So if you're preparing for October, November exams, this is certainly the place for you to be. And I will be doing end of chapter questions from the textbook that I am using as requested by some of you so that that would also help you as you prepare for your exams. But one thing that I would just share with you is that many students have reported that this channel has been very, very helpful to them. Um, and they have reported improving their grades by listening to the videos and practicing parts papers. So please, by all means, uh, make sure you make very good use of these videos. Okay, so let's start with the definition of genetic engineering. Now, you've probably heard of the term GMO. Everybody complains about it, the GMO in our foods, GMO in farm animals, all of those things. GMO stands for genetically modified organism. And what it basically is, is an organism that has been genetically engineered to express certain traits. So if we had to put it in a definition, we we'll explain the process in a very brief detail. In very brief detail, we would then say that genetic engineering is a process whereby you remove genes from one organism and you transfer it to another organism, which then expresses these genes and basically has a combination of traits. So, if we had to think about it in a different way, and let me just try to. Um, annotate here with my red pen as usual so let's say for example i grow white roses in my garden okay i'm just going to draw them as circles over here or rather um, i should actually use white for that so that you're not confused so let's say i grow white roses in my garden right and all of a sudden i realize that there is a need for yellow roses so more people prefer to have yellow roses, maybe because they believe yellow is bright, it's beautiful. Um, they don't really want the white roses. So in this case, I have two choices. I can um, either do a genetic modification of these white roses so that they don't come out as white anymore, but rather they come out as yellow. Or I could dye these roses or maybe feed them some sort of dye and then make them turn yellow. But obviously, if I dye them, that might affect how long they last or you know how they function or any, any other factors that are desirable to my clients and so in that case then I can genetically modify them. So how do I genetically modify them? I can go to a place where I can pick up yellow roses and I can then take out the gene that expresses this yellow color. All right, and I can then take that gene, cut it out of the DNA of these yellow roses, and insert it into these new plants that are supposedly to be um, that are supposed to be white rather. Um, so if I do that, and they then take up the yellow gene, and I remove the white gene from them, they will then start to express yellow color. So basically, genetic engineering involves putting in new genes into certain organisms so that they can express certain traits. Another example of that would be for example purple tomatoes i don't know if you guys have seen this but i saw an example once where a person had a tomato that was purple usually we have tomatoes that are red but if you want to make a tomato purple you simply need to go and get a gene for purple color and put that into the tomato remove the red gene and then you would have the expression of purple in the tomato in this case where you have the new dna that contains genes from two different organisms we call that dna recombinant dna which means in this case of the white roses they keep all of their other traits i'm just going to draw it in white they keep all of their other traits except for the traits where they code for yellow 
Um, and so in this case, this becomes recombinant because it's a combination of the gene that the white rose had and the gene that was inserted into it in order to change its color. I hope that was helpful. If you did not get it still, please post a question in the comments and I'll, I'll try as much as possible to answer. So, like I said, the organism that expresses the combined DNA is called a genetically modified organism, or in some cases they are referred to as transgenic. So transgenic and genetically modified organism are more or less the same thing. So how does gene transfer happen? Um, so the first thing, these are the essential steps. So whenever you want to do a genetic engineering um, process, these are more or less the steps that you would take. But obviously, depending on what you're dealing with, you might find that there are more steps that you might have to add. But in this case, just given an overview of gene transfer, the first thing that you do is that you identify the gene that you require. So for example, if you want um, a plant to be able to grow in a high temperature environment and you find another plant that has a gene that allows it to do so, then you identify the gene in the second plant and you cut out that gene. So you can cut it from a chromosome, um, you can cut it from mRNA that has been made by reverse transcription, um, or you can even make it from, from nucleotides yourself. So basically the point is you have to get the gene, you identify it. The next thing you then do is that you multiply the copy of the gene that you have. So like I said, if I had a plant that grows well in heat, in high temperatures, and I wanted another plant to be able to do so, I can extract DNA from the plant that is already adapted to do so, but I have to multiply the copies of that DNA because I can't just rely on that one copy that I've got. If I rely on that one copy and my transfer is not successful, then I would have to go back and do the extraction again and do all of those things. So we use a technique called polymerase chain reaction to do that. And I think in the next video, I go into a bit of detail about polymerase chain reaction, but it's basically a process where you amplify the number of DNA copies that you have. Once you've amplified the number of DNA copies, you can then insert um, the gene into a vector. So a vector is like a vehicle that helps to deliver the gene. So whenever you want to take a gene from one organism to the other, you have to use a vector to deliver the gene. You can't just throw the gene into the new organism. The reason for that is if you throw the gene into the new organism, there is a chance that the gene would not assimilate with the DNA of the new organism, and that means that your gene would be wasted. So in this case, we use vectors for that, and examples of vectors are things like plasmids. Some viruses are also vectors and you also have liposomes. The vector then takes the gene into the cells and it ensures that the genes are expressed in the cells. Um, and in that way, you can identify the, the cells that have the new gene and you can clone them in order to make many more of them. As we go on in this chapter, obviously it becomes a little bit clearer, but these are the essential steps for gene transfer. So if you want to do gene transfer based on what um, I have just explained as the overview, some of the things that you will need would be enzymes. And the big enzymes that are really um, important for you to remember are the restriction enzymes, um, ligase, as well as an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Restriction enzymes are basically enzymes that cut DNA. So if you look here, this is a, a restriction enzyme called EcoR1 over there and eco r1 cuts dna here um, at this point that says g where you can see this arrow over here i'm just going to erase that so you can see clearly um, so you can see the arrow over there so it cuts there and it also cuts there and you can see that as a result of that it gives two ends and you can insert a new gene in these spaces here all right and by inserting the new gene you then basically um put in this new gene that would then enable the DNA to express it. So restriction enzymes are usually produced by bacteria and they can break down um, DNA of invading viruses. They cut the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA at specific places. So you can see that eco R1 cuts at this specific sequence. Um, SMA1 cuts at this specific sequence. Now some genes, um, some restriction enzymes cut in the way eco r1 cuts this is like what you might call a staggered cut right so it when it cuts it gives a shape that looks like that where there is one part of the gene over here and the other part is somewhere that's a bit longer and it's sitting over there we call these sticky ends so sticky end endonucleases are usually preferred because they basically give room for the dna to reattach um, 
especially when after you've added a sequence to reattach without any problems blunt ends can be quite difficult to work with as it as an sma1 because it cuts right through and it gives very straight ends and as a result these ends don't feel any need to reattach so you would need the use of a different enzyme to seal the gap so if you were to insert your new dna in here you'd need another enzyme to seal the gaps between um, the ends of the DNA and your new DNA. Um, so those gaps are usually sealed by an enzyme called ligase. If you remember from chapter six, if you haven't watched the video on chapter six, please make sure you do so. Ligase is the enzyme that helps us to seal gaps between DNA. You also have reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase, I hope that you still remember, is a very important enzyme because it is the enzyme that's responsible for HIV's ability to take itself from RNA to DNA and then in, um, introduce itself and integrate itself into a person's DNA. So like the name suggests, reverse transcriptase, it reverses transcription. So transcription is usually DNA to mRNA. Reverse transcriptase allows mRNA to go back to DNA. Now, just looking at the restriction enzymes again in a bit more detail and just showing you um, where they cut. So this is where I want you to sort of look at. And the reason I have put this here is because um, I've seen a couple of questions where students have to work out things based on where the DNA um, is cut. And I'll try as much as possible to do a past question on that so that you are not too lost. But I do believe that I've already done one. So just go under the playlist where you have past papers and you might be able to find the video. So here um, you can see ECO R1 cuts in a staggered va um, fashion. So does BAM H1. Um, and so does HIND3, but -E, HAE3 um, cuts blunt ends. Um, so it's just important for you to know that and to also pay attention to the sequences or the regions where they cut so that when you come across them in the exam, you're not too lost. Going on with the tools that you need for a successful gene transfer, you can use something called a vector, just like I said, and vectors are usually used to get a new gene into a recipient. And an example of a vector is a plasmid. So if you remember correctly, we once spoke about plasmids when we were discussing bacteria and also talking about how bacteria can pass antibiotic resistance to each other. And so a plasmid is basically the circular DNA um, that is usually found in bacteria. It is small, it is circular, it has an origin of replication, um, it is easy to copy. Like basically there are just so many factors that make plasmids um, very good vectors. And they're naturally occurring in bacteria, like I said, they can be transferred from one bacteria to the other. You can always extract plasmids. So usually when you need a plasmid as a vector, you can extract it from the bacteria by breaking the walls, the cell wall of the bacteria, spinning the bacteria in a centrifuge at a high speed so that you can separate the plasmid from the chromosomal DNA. And you can then cut the plasmid using those enzymes we spoke about on the previous slide. Um, those are the restriction enzymes. Now, now look here, if we look at this plasmid, for example, if this is the restriction site, um, you can see over there. So the restriction site means that the enzyme cuts at this point and you can then insert your new gene into the plasmid and you can see that this is the new gene that has been inserted and as a result of that when you take this plasmid and you put it in another bacteria so let's say for example i'll use an example from my um, academic experience so when i was in my undergraduate study we had to do research on um, breaking down cellulose using yeast but the yeast um, that we were using was unable to break down cellulose it could only ferment the cellulose after it had been broken down. But we wanted the yeast to be able to break down and ferment. So what we did then is that we took a plasmid from a bacteria. That bacteria had the ability or it had the gene for breaking down cellulose. And we took the, the um, gene from the bacteria, we inserted it into a plasmid like so, and we then moved this plasmid into the yeast. So it meant that when the yeast multiplied, the yeast was then able um, to basically transfer this plasmid to all its new um, generations. And as a result of that, they were able to break down cellulose. So that was what we did there. So you can, the cut plasmid and the new gene would just basically be mixed together and you can use DNA ligase to seal any gaps that might be there. And this is how you use plasmids as vectors. 
Okay, again, let's look at some of the properties of plasmids that allow them to be used in gene cloning. Um, so first things first, they have a very low molecular mass, so they are easy to extract. They have what we call an origin of replication. An origin of replication simply means that there is a room for a transcription factor to bind and then replicate the plasmid um, if necessary. Um, they have several target sites for restriction enzymes and they also have what we call the marker genes. So marker genes are things that students sometimes um, get confused about, so I'm just going to explain that very quickly. So if, say, for example, I take um, this um, plasmid over here and I am putting it into a new organism. So say that this is bacteria A. I just realized that I need some colors for this. So let's say this is bacteria A. And in bacteria A, we have this plasmid over here. Okay, and now um, I'll use a purple one here. So this is bacteria B, and this plasmid over here contains a gene um, that we want to put in bacteria B. So let's say the gene is antibiotic resistance. We can take this plasmid from bacteria A, put it in bacteria B over here. All right, but then how do we know if this bacteria B now has antibiotic resistance? Well, one step to do that would be to cultivate this bacteria on a plate that has the antibiotic on it and see if it's able to grow. But that would take uh, more or less 24 hours to 72 hours, so maybe we don't want to do that. We can then look for marker genes on the plasmid, and marker genes can be genes like maybe fluorescence, for example. So once we have completed the genetic transfer and everything, Thing. We can simply check by shining some kind of UV light or any kind of special light on the bacteria itself and see if it fluoresces. And if it does that, then we can say, oh, okay, if it has the fluorescence gene, then it certainly has the antibiotic resistance gene as well. So that is what a marker gene does. So many plasmids have marker genes that also enable us to identify if um, cells have been have taken up the plasmid or the new gene. Something else I want to say here is that usually you get questions that say outline the structure of a plasmid. Please note that these are not things that are part of the structure of a plasmid. These are simply properties of plasmids that allow us to use them in gene cloning. So outline the structure of a plasmid, you would simply say that they are small. Um, it's usually two marks and you would also say that they are circular. All right. So they are small and they are circular and they um, or you can say they have a loop shape, but don't list these. Then when you're asked what the properties of plasmids are that allow them to be used in gene cloning, you can then list any of these ones. Okay, um, the last bit here is um, again just explaining what the marker genes are, so you can just have a look at that. Um, but the last bit that I want you to remember is um, when you insert a gene, um, for the when you're inserting a gene into another organism, you have to insert all of the other key regions. So if you remember when we discussed something, um, was it the LAC operon, and this was in chapter 16, where we were discussing gene control, we spoke about things like um, insert, having a promoter, having an inducer, having an operator, those kinds of things, all of those key regions must be inserted with any gene that you're inserting into a new organism. So if, for example, we were inserting the LAC-A, um, LAC-Z, and LAC-Y genes, um, and these are the genes that are needed to break down lactose, we must also insert the promoter for these genes as well as the inducers or whatever it is that need to be included in the in the LAC operon, which means we can't just take these genes out of the LAC operon and insert them only. We must insert the entire operon. So that's important to know if you are doing gene transfer. So this is the end of this video. I will do the next video where I just explain the different processes that we have in genetic engineering engineering, such as polymerase chain reaction. We also have gel electrophoresis and we have microarrays. So please make sure you don't miss that. Until the next video, have a good time. Goodbye.